let's attack tonight's fourth lecture, Border Wars and the uh, Cycle of Violence, Infiltration, Terrorism, Reprisal Raids, 1952 to 56. Um, we start off by talking about where it all begins, and it's a, uh, a basic problem that's never going to go away, and that is the map of Israel as a result of the Independence War. Um, Israel obviously declared its independence May 14, 1948, and um, the uh, idea was that they're supposed to have certain borders, but if we all know the Arabs attacked, and it's a little more complicated than we talked about in the past, I'm not going to go over it again, but uh, the key point I want to get across is that the 1948-49 war, because it started um, with the foundation of Israel in 48, and I'm talking about the Arab invasions, and it lasted until mid-49 in many places. Um, but it wasn't a regular war. It was artificially ended. Israel's success was uh, sharply interrupted by uh, Truman, okay? Um, even though he did some good things, but this was a very bad thing. If you recall, for example, last year, or two years ago when we talked about it, um, Israel was on a roll in late 48, and uh, they'd finally gotten their act together uh, to get their military um, organization down right, which they did not have before then. And once they did, it was gangbusters, and they conquered the Negev from the Egyptian army, and the bottom line is that they, they were going to take out the uh, Gaza Strip. It was right in their hands, and Truman stopped them at the end. He insisted on uh, the Israeli army stopping, and this, of course, it became a pattern in 56, in 67, in 73, and so forth, that, you know, that, that Israel doesn't have a regular war situation, but it operates always within a very interesting and, and, and confining international straitjacket, and uh, it is what it is, and the, consequently, the border lines had no logic. Um, they simply reflected where Ritz Sahal was at that moment. Sirius Yiga alone, who was on his way to the Suez Canal, when he was forced back by Truman and forced Ben-Gurion to force alone to go back with the Israeli army, and he wouldn't let him even go into the Gaza Strip, and I'll say it again, they had, they had the Egyptians on the run, and um, the result is that uh, the ceasefire line simply reflected where the armies were at that moment, which makes no political sense or geographical sense, it's just where things happen to be at that moment. Um, for Israel, this is the worst possible thing that could have happened. That's my argument tonight. Oh, the Ben-Gurion and his colleagues did not see it that way. They uh, thought that, you know, uh, this is the beginning of a peace negotiations and we'll be able to work. They, they, they were clueless. Um, now, I can say that with hindsight, one could argue they should have seen it at that time. But again, maybe I'm being too uh, pushy over here. Maybe they felt they had no choice. Whatever the case is, it, it, everybody, I think, all objective observers would agree that the result was the worst possible of the alternatives. Um, a permanent geographical reality was accepted on the basis of temporary hopes. Ben-Gurion and his company thought, Ben-Gurion and his colleagues, who were the decision makers, they thought that the Arabs would acquiesce in Israel's existence, in its conquered borders, and an expulsion of 650,000 Palestinian Arabs, right? Ben-Gurion convinced himself that Yes, we're just stopping here, but we'll work out a political settlement, and the Arabs will agree to number one. They'll also agree to number two, and they'll even agree to number three. Now, you know, and I know with hindsight of 60 years, this was a self-deception, but nevertheless, it happened. Uh, it's self-deceptive for the most simple reason. What pressure was there on the Arabs? There was none. Now, let me uh, make it clear what I'm talking about. Let's go to the next one. Here's what the United Nations gave for Israel in 47. Here's what Israel ended up with. So they ended up with a lot more territory. Not enough, perhaps, but a lot more territory. They got all this. They're all in the Galilee is a very important area. And down here and in the middle, they got up to Yerushalayim and half of the city. As you know, compare the two maps. That says it all. Uh, he thought that the Arabs would agree to this, and let alone that they kicked out well over half a million um, Palestinians from the extra areas that they took over as well as the areas of Israel proper. And they thought they would agree to it. Uh, why should they? But he convinced himself, these, as I mentioned last week with the Sephardim and the Ashkenazim, you don't look to logic in history, you look to culture. Okay? Because this, this is important. Culture is everything. And it trumps all. Consider, if you will, a, a kid in the inner city of Baltimore who's very successful in a life of crime and is very clever in selling drugs, ev evading arrest, um, manipulating the system and all the rest of it. So this a kid has a lot of smarts. Why don't he take this smart and become a doctor? Why don't he, 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 obviously, the person I'm talking about has the ability. He could be the Ben Carson. It's culture. 
It's not within their cultural horizon. He's going to use all the smarts in the wrong way. It's the same thing over here. Ben-Gurion, Moshe Sharet, the army, they're all very smart, but they operate within a certain culture with cultural assumptions. And the result is, you can deceive yourself and, and think a certain reality is what it is when it isn't. Um, now, to be perfectly honest, if Israel would have agreed to number two and number three, if they would have agreed to take back all the Arabs and give back all the land to go back to the United Nations lines, it's possible, I emphasize it's possible, they might have gotten agreement on number one. They might have got the Arabs to agree, right? If they, would, if they would give this back and they would give that back, they let them all back in, they might agree to number one. Of course, if you let back another 650,000 Arabs, then you'd have a Arab majority. But to be techni technical about it, if they would have given this back, they would only... But uh, Truman and, and, uh, and Atchison and Atlee, that's what they said. You know, this was the official plan. Uh, and by the way, that is the official position of the PLO today. They say, you know, we, we will accept Bidi Evid, a state of Israel, but they've got to give back the uh, 47, 48 lines, go back to that. And they have to take back all the, the right of return, as they refer to it today. Uh, so you know this. Now, that would be destruction of Israel, but, but you asked me what my terms were. <laughs> so not much has changed, you see, in, in, in 60 years. This was the essence of Arab-Israeli politics in 1949 to 1952, as we discussed uh, last year. Here were the Arab leaders at that time. Let's go to the next one, right? He was the head of uh, Iraq, and here's King Abdullah. These were the moderates, and the position of moderates was let the refugees all go back and uh, withdraw to the lines that the United Nations has set up. Uh, I, you invaded us. I said, okay, that's yesterday, but let's, we want a final piece. This is our terms. And uh, th that was the best deal on the table uh, for Israel. I repeat, that was the moderate position. The uh, people like the next slide, the Grand Mufti Jerusalem, they said under no conditions, you know, we're going to wipe out Israel, period. Uh, so this is the nature of the political universe of uh, that era. Were, those in Israel, were there those in Israel who wanted to pursue this option? Maybe, but it doesn't matter, because Ben-Gurion was the personification of the idea of refusing this option, and he dominated the Mapai, and the Mapai dominated Israeli politics and controlled uh, foreign policy totally. Here, uh, for example, is um, Ben-Gurion. Here's his uh, Rabbi uh, uh, Levin from the Agoda. Um, what I'm trying to say is he had ministers in the government who basically said like this, Ben-Gurion, you run the foreign policy. You understand? He wasn't interested in, in, in those issues. And, and that's true of most of the members of the cabinet. And so he had a free hand, and he wasn't interested in giving in on giving back land and certainly letting the Arabs back in. The main reason for Ben-Gurion's stand, um, the stand opposing, opposing number two and opposing number three, was uh, the lack of any real pressure on Israel to guilt anything of value. And here's something that most people don't get right. Uh, the reason this was the case was because the balance of military forces in the Middle East uh, strongly favored Israel. Israel has always spoken about the fact that they're a single country against an Arab sea, and the Arabs want to push them to sea, and all that kind of stuff. Yes, this is true. There's no question about that. But, Avi, is everything working? Yeah, okay. Huh? The reason, what you have to remember is the following, or you don't have to remember, you don't know in the first place. Israel had a much bigger army than all the Arabs put together. Many people don't realize that. Um, Israel, even though they had a much smaller population, was a modern state, and so they introduced a draft. Uh, for everybody, and with the rarest of exceptions. And in the time I'm talking about, for example, there were 500 yeshiva exceptions. You know, that's what the policy, po population was in Israel. And so Israel, an army of 100,000, especially when they started drafting girls, um, Jordan had an army during the 48 war of 6,000. And eventually they tripled it, 18,000. That's nothing. Assyria had an army of something like 20, 25,000. Egypt had an army of 35, 40,000. Now, you ask me a question. They have such a big population, why not draft an army? First of all, it's not a simple draft an army. It costs a fortune. These countries are very poor, and unless they got subsidies from overseas, they couldn't put together such a huge force. It costs a fortune. Second of all, army requires people to have a certain literacy, uh, certain uh, abilities. If you know the history of America in World War I and World War II, they turned down tons of people because there are these farm boys from the south that had rickets and bad feet and no teeth and this and that and the other. Sounds funny, but it really is true. So to uh, mobilize and mass an army is not as simple as, as one would imagine. The more modern, the more westernized the state, um, and the more pressure they feel, the more they can do so. Ben-Gurion's government 
one of the main pillars of his policy was militarism. And I don't mean the sense of going to conquer the world, but giving great, great primacy to military security needs because of the nature of Israel. Okay? So the army got priority in many areas during these years. It's one of the reasons they had trouble with the immigrant absorption. And it's one of the problems Israel has as we speak now, if you follow the news. As in every democracy, I repeat, in every democracy, there's always battles about how big the defense budget should be. And there are always very good arguments for cutting, def and there really are, there are always very good arguments for cutting the defense budget and using more civilian needs, and the civilian needs are there, there's no question about it. At the same time, it's also true that when you cut too much on the defense, you end up uh, having a, an attack or something, which turns out that you didn't, you didn't save any money. You see, so it's, a, it's an existential conundrum, it's an existential problem. But in the years I'm talking about, under Ben-Gurion, even though there were issues with the army, uh, Tzahal was uh, bigger, better trained, and better equipped than all the other Arab armies, uh, thanks to Ben-Gurion's military mania. And, uh, and, and, you know, this is the famous type of way he liked to present himself, walking around in a uniform. All, no, I'm sorry. No, he was, uh, I mean this in the sense, this was his leadership model. He tried to present the idea that we have to be very big on that. Sahal, we shouldn't look at the army as a, some kind of militarist, fascist sort of thing. It's a personification of the people. It's, it's, it's the end of the Holocaust, guys, next time we fight. All these sorts of messages go in there. And so let's say, for example, you're talking about Israel versus Jordan. Or let's say, for example, you're talking about Israel versus Lebanon. It's a giant versus a midget. King Abdullah knew this. The leaders of Lebanon, for example, know this. To be perfectly honest, the Egyptians kind of noticed they just resented very much. Young officers like Nasser and others who, were, who had lost in the 48 war, and one of the reasons they will make a revolution, we'll talk about in the future, in Egypt is because they said there's something basically wrong. If a huge country like Egypt has such a small army and a weak one, and Israel, which is so much smaller and poorer, has a better army, that shows that we don't have our system right and we want to do something about changing the system in a radical manner. So in the early years, in 49, even to 55, that's a long time, the early years of Israel, Israel was much stronger, okay, than uh, the Arab countries. And even though the Arabs always dreamed of a second round, meaning after they lost in 48, the language that they always used was, we lost the first time, but next time we'll get it right. So did Israel, okay? Israel also dreamed of a second round, meaning... You look at the crazy borders, we'll talk about it, so they're not defensible, as I'll show you tonight. I repeat, they're not defensible because they're too long and weird. Um, they're too narrow. And uh, for whatever reason Israel accepted this in 48 and 49, within a little while, it dawned on everybody that these are impossible borders from the Israeli security point of view. And in the years I'm talking about, in the early 50s, uh, the Israeli generals and really the public itself dreamed of, oh, good, we'll have another war and next time we'll do it right. Okay. Now, you and I know none of this turned out to be simple at all, but uh, General Alone had been the top commander in, um, in the 48 War, and like I say, if Ben-Gurion hadn't stopped him, he would take over all of, of everything. Uh, Moshe Dayan, you don't have to, I don't have to tell you anything about. These are people who, who spoke and even wrote about the fact that Israel's not going to start the next war, but the minute the Arabs do, we're going in there. And as a matter of fact, as you know from the 67 war, that is what they did. They just didn't figure out the other half of the equation. But as far as military is concerned, Israel was always threatening the Arabs. It wasn't the Arabs that threatening Israel. Now, that's not the way the rhetoric went, and that's not the way the image of the world went. And in a larger sense, you have all this huge Arab and Muslim world, so I understand that. And they did want to drive the Jews into the sea, and I understand that. But it's funny, because all the people who are saying we want to drive into the sea have no power, and Israel had a much stronger and, 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 and better force. So the reason I'm mentioning this is there was nothing objective forcing Ben-Gurion that he should have to give up land or let the Arab refugees back in. The only thing that would be a force would be if Truman will say, well, cut off the money, but Truman wasn't going to do that. And so there you have the basic uh, situation. Everything I've discussed now is by way of preliminary has to do with high politics, high politics. But there's low politics. And by low politics, I mean the Palestinian Arabs, particularly the ones who've been expelled. It's 650,000 or 750,000, something like that. Where were they expelled to? Um, again, most people don't have this right. Usually, they were expelled to places not far at all from their house. Uh, no, I mean it. If you look, for example, this whole area, the, the waste of Israel, such over here, the, the, where I'm pointing the, the coastline, which is, you see, very narrow. Um, and this is not even accurate, because you've all been in Israel. You know, some of these places are nine miles wide. So this map is not really reflective of the reality. It's actually a lot skinnier than what we're looking at over here. Um, if there were Arabs and were here and they kicked them out, they just kicked them out over here, like 10, 20 miles away from the house, sometimes five miles away from the house. And they've been living five miles away from the house for 60 years now. So think what that means. 
Do you follow? You have tons of people who can see where they used to live. Or if they walk for a half hour and stand on a hill, they can see where they used to live. So this is a crazy situation, meaning what is the plan? Who thought this situation? It's the worst of all possible uh, re realities. They think, the Arabs think, in 48 and in 49 and afterwards, that as soon as the fighting is over in their neighborhood, they go back to their houses, or at least to their fields. This starts already in the fall of 1948, meaning during the war of independence, when Israel was fighting on the Egyptian front, they had already basically had a ceasefire, which never uh, was changed, on the Jordanian front. So this entire area that I'm speaking about here, and we've all been in Israel, so you know what I'm talking about, this whole area over here, the fighting stopped in uh, September or so of 1948, even though the war went on for almost another year. But the fighting for the rest of the year was down here, in this area, okay, and also all the way up here in, in Syria. So where the majority of the Palestinians are living and the refugees, meaning the people who were kicked out, the, the, um, the, the, the battle is over, the actual combat is over, around September or so, 48, Rosh Hashanah, if you will, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, uh, 48. And most of these people are peasants. They can't read or write. All they know is this with their land. And this is where they always used to go, uh, uh, um, apple picking or orange picking or, or um, you know, sowing and, and, and reaping and things like that. And so, as I say before, uh, they just start walking back, um, men, women, and children. And it's not like Israel had a, an army to, to you know, block this whole long area. They didn't. And so you have a totally porous situation in which you have, I guess, you have a totally porous situation, which lasts till 1956 at least. Think about that. First eight years of Israel, you just have a situation where people are just crossing all the time. And the Israelis can't stand it, but you can't stop so and so many people. Um, and so, what should Israel do? You got men, women, and children. The years 1948 to 56 see tens of thousands, listen to what I'm about to tell you, tens of thousands annually cross the frontier to harvest and sow. This is not the picture we get from Israeli movies. It's weird, especially to the new kibbutzim of Moshavim, because they set up a new kibbutz in a land that used to belong to the Arabs. And then people from 10 miles away, or 20 miles away, to show up, right? And not to kill, not necessarily. A lot of them come, you know, without weapons. They just want to go and, and, and do what they've been doing until now. You say, there's no longer land. They don't get that, right? And so what exactly do you do? The Arabs don't show up in the winter because there's no harvesting or plowing. They're farmers. So in the winter, it's a, you know, an all-Jewish area. It comes in the spring and the summer. It's every day, every night, to be perfectly honest. Every night. It's, it, 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 it's, it's a caravan, you know, it's a traffic. Um, what should Israel do? If you do nothing, they'll squat, as the Jews have done earlier. Right? They'll be squatters. If you do nothing, then they'll come and pick. Next thing they do, they'll sit down there. Next thing they have a tent. Next thing you have a city. This is just, this is just the reality. That's what the Zionists have done. That's how they acquired their area in Israel. They set up a kibbutz somewhere. They set up a moshav somewhere. set up a house. These are realities. Those who follow current Israeli situation closely knows that this is what's happening currently in the Negev. Is that true? Where the Bedouins are just sitting down and just starting. When you drive in the Negev, you know, who gave them the right to do anything? Nobody gave them right. They just, there they are. Now it's 100 people. Now it's 1,000 people. And what do you do to 1,000 people? And then it's 10,000 people. And, and, and what is it? It's called a fait accompli. So Israel was terrified that this would happen. So what exactly do you do? Um, if you only punish the men, then the Arabs will learn the system and they'll send women. If you only punish the men and the women, they'll send kids. Everybody knows, as soon as you set up any kind of rules, smart people will figure a way around the rules. That, that's, that's how life is. And so Israel then said early on, Ben-Gurion said early, you've got to punish them all. Shoot them all. Aim Brera. Well, whoa, really? Uh, I mean, uh, look what you're turning into. You're turning into a killer state. I mean, was this what Israel was set up to be? Now, I told you, if you had those borders in the first place, it'd be a different story. So when they accepted these, they made a terrible mistake. But nevertheless, now you have to live with the uh, results. Ben-Gurion says, yes, that's right. Aim Brera. Besides, there's no YouTube and there's no CNN. And so there's no downside to it. And so from 48 to 56, is a lot of shootings by Israel of Arabs crossing the border, including men, women, and children. Um, armed and not armed, and this is the way it went. Not everybody, but it happened, it happened uh, quite a bit. Um, most of the Palestinians, those times, you will be honest, are not coming to steal. Uh, excuse me, they're coming to, to, to not to kill, but to steal, or to recover, as they see it. After all, it's his field, as far as he knows. It's not, it's not his fault, as he sees it. The line now separates um, his house from the field. In a lot of places, and you'll see later, and I have a little video about this, in a lot of places, 
the way they drew the ceasefire lines, because it just happens to be where the army stopped and when they made the ceasefire. It had no sense whatsoever. Could be in the middle of a, a territory. Well, look at this. Here's the town where I'm pointing over here where these guys are sitting, and here's the field where you're sitting. It could be that close. And it so happens that the line ran here and they put the barbed wire up, and here's all the guys in the, in the town. They said, but this is our field. This is how we make a living. Not anymore. You see? So it's, 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 it's a, a, as toxic a political situation as you could imagine. Um, but it doesn't matter. Shoot him. And so the glorious war of independence um, transitions into an inglorious war against civilians who, are, who as individuals are tragedies, but as a group constitute a moral threat to the state of Israel. And this is the um, tough consequences of political independence. You understand? When you have no nation, you have nothing, you can, you can spout whatever generalities you want to do. When you're there on the ground, then uh, difficult situations arise. The United States of America faces this today with the drones and these other things. There's not a country in the world, including the Arab countries, that don't face similar situations. But that is the price of doing business if you want to have an independent state, particularly if you want to have this crazy border set up over there that they described. And I re repeat for the fifth time and not the last time tonight, this is, the, this is the ideal solution according to the international community, that Israel should go back to these borders. Okay? Now, um, the Arabs are, in, are enraged at the helplessness of their governments. People in the West Bank, for example, in Egypt, like, where's the government? But the governments realize to start a war with Israel now will only result in Israeli victory and expansion, which is true. For this reason, during the first years of the state, down to 56, the Arab governments tried to restrain the Arabs, their Palestinian refugees, from crossing into Israel. Now, Israel will deny this, and they'll put propaganda that everything is, is a plot on the part of Arab governments to undermine Israel. It's actually not true, okay? Um, in reality, the Arab governments realize all they're doing is getting people killed, and they look bad, and so forth, and they, and they didn't want to provoke more trouble, and they tried to hold it back. Um, here's uh, the, the commander of the Jordanian Legion, Glub Pasha General, the British uh, guy, General Glub, who converted to Islam, and um, he has very interesting memoirs. Uh, very interesting. And of course, he's anti-Israel, obviously, he's for Jordan. But uh, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, uh, can we go back to the map of Israel for a second? Yeah, right there. Right there, right there it is. Uh, this is the West Bank, which is controlled by Jordan. Glub kept the army here. You understand? On the other side of the Jordan River. Because if you keep them here, it's too easy for Israel to do a pincer movement thus and thus. You, you, can, you, can, uh, you know, from the south and the north from Beersheba area north and from up here in the Galilee south and cut off and wipe out the whole Jordanian army. So military necessity requires that the Jordanian army stay on the other side. Right? They're afraid it'll go up like this and then down like that. I can't see if I'm doing it right. But you get the idea. And so, once again, it's not exactly the way we imagine reality is. Um, anyway, so think along those lines. As far as Israel is concerned, they say these are deliberate infiltrations in Israel launched by Arab governments precisely to undermine us. This is what uh, Moshe Shared is always saying, the foreign minister, Abi Ibn, very eloquent speeches about this in the United Nations and elsewhere, and Israel is under a campaign. Objectively, they're not exactly wrong, meaning the refugees constitute a big problem, but it's not really some nefarious plot in the Arab capitals to do this. It's not true, but it's the Israeli line. The truth is there's no way a small undermanned Israel can close its long borders, especially the Jordanian border, right? Now, if they had conquered the West Bank in the, in the 48 war and they just had to hold a straight line, you could actually do it. History would be very, very different, but that's dreamland, right? That's for, for the nine days. Um, they cannot even stop 30 to 40,000 Arabs from returning and settling in Israel. You understand? that even the, whatever the number of population was in Israel, 160,000, by the time you, the War of Independence was over, these are Arab Israelis, that is to say, these are Arabs who were within the Israeli lines when the War of Independence was over. Another 40,000, so just sneak over, and Israel was never able to sort them out, and they're just there, you see? Um, they didn't do this, which, you know, this is the Wall of Sharon. You all know what I'm talking about, you've been in Israel. That's the security wall. If they wanted to really do it right, if, 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 they would have built one of these in 1949. They didn't want to do it because then it would, they would cut off their options from conquering the West Bank. So it's a messy business on both sides. You understand? So they'd rather in those, I, I assure you, if they would go to Truman and say, give us $50 million to build a wall, so he would do it. That would stop all the border problems. You see? Uh, they didn't, Israel didn't want to do it either. And so you have a real mess 
because you can't hold the 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 the, the, the frontier areas properly. On the other hand, uh, you know you're very powerful. The result is weird. Israel is very sound on basic security, but unsound on current security. This is the terminology that Sahal came up with at the beginning of State of Israel. Basic security is national security. That is to say, Israel is very sound in terms of Arab armies invading them and taking over the state. They can beat all the Arab armies, right? Um, they're a better army by far. But they're very bad on this, what they call current security, which is every day people crossing over and undermining the country. It's what we call nowadays, in the fancy terms, asymmetric warfare which has turned out to be the Achilles heel of all the great powers, including America. When they blew up the Marines in, in, in um, Reagan's time, what did they do? Nothing, right? When they uh, shot up everybody in Somalia, what did Clinton do? Nothing. Do you get what I'm saying? There's a such thing as asymmetric warfare, and Israel has suffered from its own version of, of, of that um, for 16,000 infiltrations in 1952. Think what I just said. You see the map of Israel, and you know the border was crossed by Arabs 16,000 uh, times. Uh, that's how many times a day. It's, it's, you can't control it, you see? Unless you're willing to build a wall, which they didn't want to do. Now, is Ben-Gurion's policy sound? Just to shoot everybody and so forth? That's the $64,000 question, which is debated, my friends, down till today. On the one hand, there's no real security outside the city of Tel Aviv in these years. Do you get that? Now, those people roam, especially at night, give Arab groups all over the place, except in the, in, inside the city of Tel Aviv. Um, that's not good. Kibbutzim, during these years, locked down at night. It's a psychological warfare, meaning you're always afraid of infiltrators and everyone's allowed to come in and they shoot up people, whatever. It's the kind of thing that happens, as we all know nowadays, except that today, 60 years later, Israel has picked up a lot of lessons along the way, and so, Bar Hashem, they're better at it than they did before. But we all know, every once in a while, there's, a, somebody, you know, there's no system that somebody devises that somebody else can't, can't figure out to break, break through. It is what it is. Maybe the Vatikim, maybe the old-time settlers can handle this, but not the new Olim they want to leave. Okay? If you have people that are chazak and committed and you know the Palmach type and all that, and they're in a moshav and a kibbutz and very ideologically motivated, they will man the uh, mishmar and the walls and they'll do all that and they're, and they're ready to you know, fight for Israel, so to speak, even at the level of, of every night. But you take new people off the boat from Iraq, or from Morocco, or from Poland, Holocaust survivors. And that's not what they figured. They figured they're going to a Jewish state. It's going to be like, like today, you know, El, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem. And it's, it's going to be not, and that's not what they necessarily find to be the case. So at this level, it was kind of an existential problem for Israel because it could possibly trigger an exodus out of the country in a big way. More importantly, violence begets violence. At first, most of the Arab infiltrators, most are not violent. But the surest way to start a blood feud, the surest way to escalate is to kill some Arab's relative, especially an old person or a woman or a child. You know, you know their culture. And the result is by 1950 or 51, the infiltrators really start to turn violent. This is a time when the Sahal, when the Israeli army, is undergoing a malaise. Uh, Yigal Yadin was the first or second uh, uh, chief of staff of the Israel, he ran the Israel army, and he put it together. In his time, they had such growing pains to reorganize the army from just the militias and the way they had it, the Haganah, into the Israeli army, there were a lot of screw-ups and a lot of slip-ups. It's called growing pains. And he himself was very stiff, and he wanted to make exactly a Western army, which is not what the Israeli army was designed to be. Uh, he, he really wanted to be an exact copy of the British army, and we Jews are not the British, right? It, you know, the, the British organized it out of their national and ethnic traditions. Uh, it didn't quite work so well. You know, he, if, if you don't salute in the time of your dinner, oh, you get a terrible punishment and things like this. It's not, it didn't, didn't work so well. Second of all, they were taking in a tons and tons of uh, refugees, as we know. They doubled the population. Think about that. They doubled the population in three years. Um, they're drafting everybody. They can't, the soldiers can't speak Hebrew. Um, you know, all kind of problems in there. Uh, Ben-Gurion wants more uh, money to be spent on this side of the uh, uh, of the military budget. Yadin says, I'm the professional doing this side, and they argue. So the army went, went a profound malaise, which means that there was a bad morale. It means that um, when they were sent to accomplish missions, they didn't get accomplished. They had sent them over several times to take over certain occupied territories in the Syrian border, and that's all was driven back. Um, the officers and the soldiers did it wrong. There was a certain cowardice, if you want to call it that. You see things weren't going right, and that's exactly what we need. Now comes all these infiltrators in to, to start shooting up places. 
Uh, so it was a real problem. Israeli casualties, I want to make it clear, are light during these years. Um, between 48 and 56, is uh, how many civilians are killed by the Arab? 400. Right? Now, I realize every person is precious, and I mean that, but it's very little. And another 400 militaries, so 800 altogether, at a time when Israel took in 800,000. So one could say, is the price of doing business? Right? Well, we're taking a mass number, you're going to lose a few along the way. Um, they're very, but one is enough. And a country like Israel, especially in the early years, but even today, one of our weaknesses and one of our strengths is that we all freak out over Gilad Shalit. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? In, in, in any other culture, one, you know, how's the expression go? He was expendable. Israel's not built that way. This is our weakness. The Arabs know how to press this button. It's also our strength. Right? It's also, it's, like I said before, we're not the British army, it's the Jewish army. It's not France, it's Israel. It's a different culture. And so we care, even if one person gets hurt, that, that's who they are. Perhaps the Arabs knew this, they didn't do it. But what do you do? Again, you can't man the long frontier. You can't do it. So what do you do? Back already in 1947 and 48, the Palmach, in, 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 in the period of time when Israel was fighting just the Palestinians from December of 47 to May of 48, if you recall that period, um, they had already started a policy of a number of retaliation raids against specific Arab villages. This is one of the things that he did. Meaning, when they found out Arabs came from a certain place and killed Jews in this and this place, uh, Hamach, on a few uh, occasions, marched through right in the middle of the Arab territory, found the house of the guy who did it, killed him or blew up the house, and then withdrew. Uh, rarely, but that already began the precedent of retaliation. You see? Retaliation. Now, uh, the idea was, this is the only language the Arabs understand. In 1950, Ben-Gurion sets up a special unit called Unit Number 30 near Gaza to undertake retaliation raids in the Gaza Strip. But the unit is a failure, because I told you, the Israeli army was going through a malaise, so when they went over the border, they got killed instead of killing anybody else. They messed it up. Um, it's going to happen when you don't know exactly what you're doing. These are things that have to be learned, that there are prices to be paid in the process of learning. But the basic idea was there. As time goes on and things deteriorate, because they did, a consensus forms among Ben-Gurion and his top military officials. The only ones who can really stop Israel, uh, stop infiltration, is not Israel, but it's only Jordan and Egypt and Syria. The only way to do that is to hurt Jordan and to hurt Syria and to hurt Egypt so much that they will clamp down on their own borders. That becomes the Israeli policy. We can't do it, so you guys have to. You guys don't have to do it, you'll pay a price. Uh, was this wise? Um, there are pros and cons of this policy. The pros are that if you can embarrass or, or hit the governments hard enough, nobody can close the Arab borders down like they can. You know, it, it, let's put it this way. If a real decision was made in Cairo to do it, and they're willing to commit re resources to it, they can do it. Um, so I hear it at that level. On the other hand, the argument could be made, and I personally think this, this just got the Arabs to say like this, we should strengthen ourselves, build up our militaries uh, to be able to resist Israeli pressure. Do you, do you understand? No, the Arabs were very weak at this time. And so by poking somebody in this way, which, what, uh, all you do is get them all riled up, and then they want to do something about it, which is never smart to make your enemy uh, wake up and realize that they're weak and want them to strengthen themselves. You want to keep it always weak. But it's easy. this is, look, I'm standing here in Baltimore in a comfortable Mutsi Shabbos, you know, so you're just spilling this out. But, uh, you know, it's easier said than done. But I do think that that was the case. Anyway, um, this, is, this is how it works. For better or worse, this became Ben-Gurion's fixed policy. Okay? It's retaliation, not simply retaliation for Nakama, although that's a part of it too, no question about it. But it's also retaliation with a specific goal, which is to force the Arab governments to do what they needed to do, what Israel needed them to do. If unit number 30, as I just told you about, was a failure, and it was, Ben Gurion said, well, we've got to try again. In 1953, uh, Yadin left, and there was a new chief of staff who wants to improve the current security and also improve the morale in the IDF. This is General McClef, Mordecai McClef, who was there for one year. He's not so well known, but he'd been uh, number two in the 48 war or whatever. He was a very good staff officer, you understand, and uh, not a combat commander at all. But nevertheless, he um, said, let's try again. They used, started a new unit. Uh, forget unit number 30, start a new unit number 101 to be commanded by a 25-year-old uh, reserve major 
uh, in the Israeli army named Ariel Sharon. And that's how Sharon started his career. That, that's it, right? So he had fought, he was uh, 25 years old. He had fought in uh, the 48 one, got badly wounded. He was just a whatever. And they picked him out because he looked like he was a fighting type of guy. And, and the rest, as we say, is history, as we all know. Um, Sharon was basically, it's like one of these movies. Give you carte blanche, just get it right. And uh, that's, by the way, is, uh, is uh, what we call delegating. Isn't that right? So, um, no, I mean it. So he picks 50 selected fighters. He went around the army units. He looked for 50 vicious guys, guys interested in combat and killing. Uh, it's not your typical Jew. He doesn't want that. He wants the other kind, okay? Uh, intensive training. And uh, best training, in his opinion, is blooding, which is right off the bat, I want you to go every night, every two nights in, over the lines of the Arab country and go hit somebody. And if you get in a firefight, good. If you get in a hand-to-hand -hand fight, good. And, you know, little by little, the, the survival of the fittest. You know, you'll, you'll learn what to do. There's, there, there is no better way. It's a very um, un, unpeaceful and uncivilized way of doing it, but it's the, it's the way it's done. Uh, you, you understand? No, if you're going to go this route, then you have to make a lot. I told you before, statehood and independence has a lot of um, prices to go along with it. And so they do this. Uh, this will become a key element. It remains today a key element. You, you have to get your guys into a mood that you're not afraid of the enemy at all. Make them afraid of you. And you know, in a lot of fights, especially night fights, there's a lot to that. Anyway, after one month of training, a patrol of Unit 101 goes into the Gaza Strip as an exercise and kill 20 Arabs. Whoa, this is a brand new reality. Okay, It's not one for one or this or that. Unit 101 suffered two, two wounded soldiers. The raid was heavily condemned by the foreign observers who called in an appalling case of deliberate mass murder and, was, and the unit was publicly criticized in the Israeli cabinet by one of the, by one of the ministers. Where's Bill? How's this now? No, doesn't do any good. You want to call Bill? Is that true? Okay. Hello? Yeah. Now? Yeah. Okay. As I was saying, <laughs> uh, see how difficult it is to do these things? Um, but anyway, this, the, the unit itself was condemned in the Israeli cabinet because it says, we're going to make us look like killers and murderers. It's the beginning of this whole phenomenon you're familiar with, which is if Israel hits too hard, they get condemned. They hit too easily, too weakly, they get hurt. What do you end up doing? Um, all of a sudden, a new dynamic was created. The Arab states were not criticized for their infiltration, as it wasn't by Arab army units. Do, do you see? It's, always, it's civilians. We're not doing it. We can't stop them. And mostly economic infiltrators, they call it. I mean, they're just coming to take crops, steal cattle, uh, barbed wire, things like that. Israel was sending in formal military units. And for the purpose of killing in big numbers, the Israeli government was committing aggression. And if Arab civilians were killed, civilians... They're committing murder. And so you get this funny dynamic that Israel's always uh, stuck in. Israel, uh, as Ben-Gurion said, you know, hachazona yachsis hachoseinu, what are we supposed to do? J just take it? Look what he writes over there. We will not have the power to ensure that the water pipelines won't be exploded or that the trees will not be uprooted. We do not have the power to prevent the murders of orchard workers or families while they're asleep. But we have the power to set a high price for our blood, a price which would be high for the Arab countries, the Arab armies, and the Arab governments to bear. That's the essence of the policy. It either works or it doesn't, but that's the essence of the policy. And so Israel, as I said, before, doesn't build a wall. Instead, they go for this route. Um, if they keep their people out of our country, we'll keep our people out of your country. That's, Israel says, so we're fair. You know, what, what are we doing wrong? Uh, but it's not so simple. Because I told you before, in reality, the government of Jordan, for example, is trying to control the border. They really are trying to keep the people out of Israel, and they're opposed to killing uh, Israel. It's not because they love Israel. It's because they're afraid of the consequences, you see? So it's not exactly as if you hit 20, kill 20 here, 30 there, 40 there, you're going to necessarily get their governments to completely close down the border. It's, it's, the Jordanian government probably can't do it either. That's the uh, problem. Moreover, Israel might have politically, more to gain by turning the other cheek. That's the opinion of the 
doves in the cabinet. Moshe Sharet was the foreign minister. Committing a severe, responsive act to this bloodbath would only obscure its horrors and put us in an equal level with murderers like the other party. We should rather that this instance um, raises interest to raise political pressure on the world powers to have them exert unprecedented pressure on Jordan. That's the other swore. And this goes on till today. It's the hawks versus the doves. You see? Um, you can side with whoever you think is right. And I, I mean, I'm not saying that to be funny. But there, there are two sides to it. Um, nevertheless, on Thursday night, October 12, 53, two weeks after Simchas Torah, uh, an Arab threw a grenade in a Jewish house in Yehud, which is near Petach Tikva, and killed a mother and two kids, and hurt some others. And then the Arabs ran back, ran back, fled back into Jordan. Um, at that more civilized time, the deliberate killing of a mother and children was considered shocking even by the Jordanian army, and the Jordanian commander promised to catch the killers. He even was willing to let Israeli police and police dogs tra track them to the West Bank. Uh, but Ben-Gurion and the company didn't believe them. More accurately, he didn't care, but he was determined to hit the Jordan's, Jordanians hard to teach him a lesson. And so Sharon and unit number 101 attack a West Bank village called Kibia, and they blew it up. They basically destroyed the place with lots of Arab civilian deaths, men, women, and children. Lots. Now, Sharon said it wasn't deliberate. Maybe it wasn't, maybe it was. I mean, it wasn't deliberate in the sense they lined people up to shoot them, but they uh, attacked the town, and they, when they thought a house was empty, they just blew it up, whether anybody was inside or not. Turns out people were inside. Okay? So this is already unprecedented. There was international shock. The United Nations nationally condemned it. Eisenhower canceled all foreign aid as a result of this. He was the president at that time. He said, what's going on over here? Okay? Um, it was disastrous from the PR point of view. Ben-Gurion lied. He made a speech. He says it wasn't the army. It was Holocaust survivors nearby who went wild. <laughs> okay? Uh, but, you know, Shekhar Anglo Raglayim. You know, you can't keep a lie like that too much. The Time magazine showed up, and the Look magazine showed up, and the Herald Tribune showed up, and pushed they found out. And, uh, you know, the truth does give out. And then I even had the job of trying to explain this in the United Nations. Obviously, anybody remembers Abba, he did the best possible job. But what can you do? You know? He really had a, a tough job because these are fait accomplis that Israel is doing, and, and how do you put a, a, a good spin on it? Um, at that time, in 1953, they already talk about Sharon being a war criminal and trying for war crimes. Imagine half a century ago. Um, but it didn't happen, but Unit 101 was disbanded. That way Israel said, well, it's not going to happen again. Well, on the other hand, it wasn't really disbanded. Its men were merged with other uh, uh, soldiers and other units by the new commander-in-chief who had taken over the Israeli army, Sahal, Moshe Dayan, who becomes the most famous, as we all know, of the Israeli generals. Um, Dayan was an enthusiast for cross-border raids. He thought, this is great. If we hit him hard enough, he wrote, he wrote articles about this in Foreign Affairs magazine. This is not hidden or secret. This was Israel's official policy, you see? He said, if we hit them hard enough, the Jordanians and Egyptians will either clamp down on the, board, on the border or they'll go to war with us, which will enable us to conquer the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. So he had a very basic philosophy. He, he says, the politics stuff, I leave to the politicians. I'm just in charge of the military stuff. And the military stuff, I'll tell you how we look at it. You see? And uh, in addition, Dayan, because he wants to cure the malaise in the Israeli army, he wants to blood the whole army in order to improve its performance and raise morale. And he was pretty successful in this raising the army out of its malaise in the 54 to 56. Now, Dayan did transform the Tzal from what it was to something new, which we understand to be, oh, the Israeli army, very good at, at, at soldiering. It wasn't beforehand. You see, they had to have a special unit of 50 guys and so forth. And one of the reasons, one of the ways he does is to say, we're not afraid of the enemy, we make them afraid of us. If they come in and hit us, we hit them 10 times over. And that kind of thing appeals to people, as you can understand. Um, the modern IDF was really born during these years. And here's, uh, uh, with, with his uh, combat commanders, and each one of these guys was like famous uh, fighters. There's Sharon, and there's Harzion, all these other guys in there. And this is the new image of the Sahal, which is we're ready to take on everybody, and we'll eat you for breakfast. Okay? Now, um, two months after Kibia, uh, Ben-Gurion retires to stable care, went down to the kibbutz. This is a famous episode in Ben-Gurion's time. He didn't plan to stay out of way all the time, and he couldn't really keep his, his finger out of the pot. Uh, he wasn't that old either. And so Ben Gurion said, I'm retiring. I'm going to live the life in the kibbutz and show everybody that this is where all Israelis should be. You know, abandon the cities, which he called Ninveh and Babylon. Don't live in Tel Aviv. Uh, you know, the flesh pots of the city actually had running toilets and things like that, you know. And 
to, you know, where he's coming from, you have to live in very primitive and be pioneers and, and, and all that. Um, and uh, what it means is he's not going to be the man on the scene uh, for a while. Right in the middle of all this big period, he's replaced by Moshe Sharet as the prime minister and by Pinchas Lavon as the minister of defense, who he was the head of the Hista Drut, now they made the minister of defense, who is despised by Moshe Dayan. And this will be part of the snake pit that I'm going to talk about later on. The Israeli politics is very, very bitter in the 50s. Um, Moshe Sharet, as we saw before, as the prime minister, does not approve of Kibia-type raids, both in principle as well as out of his concern for international reactions. Now, so he thought it's wrong because it's wrong, and he also said it doesn't help us in the world. Of course, that just makes him look like a wimp to Dayan. So you have a very bad situation over here. For the next two years, there's a certain basic dysfunctionality in, 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 in uh, the Israeli security decision-making process. That's pretty bad. Because the prime minister wants to do one thing, the army does not listen to him, the defense minister says, I'm going to do this, but they end up doing that, happens over again. And Sharet, by the way, was a uh, OCD type guy, and he wrote everything in his diary, and he's very eloquent, and he writes things down to the nth de detail. And he, I'm saying, you know, all, uh, it's, it's a good thing these diaries are not published in English. <laughs> the Palestinians will do that one day. But, uh, oh my goodness, he says, Diane lied to me again, and they promised he wouldn't do this, but they really sent three people here. They you know, like got three pages of how he was deceived, and then another couple pages of what his reaction to it is. And, you know, he was like really obsessive in writing every, every single thing down. And uh, this is not good for the country, it goes without saying. Right? Because what you want is a certain unity at the top. Everybody should be on the same page. You can have different opinions, but then they should agree and follow a policy. Nothing wrong with different opinions. That you debate it out. But once you go, you go. And Charette wasn't the type that he composed himself, and the army fundamentally disagreed with him. You have to understand that I'm describing today in my limited time a tiny fraction of the constant raids and counter-raids during these first eight years of the State of Israel. And I'm only doing the big ones which had large consequences either in terms of Israel and its neighbors or in terms of international repercussions. There were a lot more. If there were 16,000 border crossings in 1952 and similar numbers in other years, you can just imagine, what are you going to do, stand here and read them all? Okay? The first big challenge, the Moshe Sharet big challenge, came, up, came soon enough. On March 17, 54, not long after he became prime minister, a few days before Purim, an Egged bus driving north late at night from Eilat to Beersheba, right through the Negev, was attacked by a bunch of Bedouins and shot up, and everybody in the bus was killed, except for a few people that they thought were dead but weren't. Okay, so it's the worst nightmare. And this is at Scorpion's Pass, Malayak Rabin. There's a, a museum there, uh, in Eilat today where they show you what the bus looked like when it left, and here's what it would look like when it was all shot up. You know, you and I live in a time, this is nothing new. What else? We know this is what, what, what the Palestinians would like to do in Israel all the time. It wasn't so common at that time. It was a big shock in, 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 uh, in Israel, okay? And uh, Israel went ballistic, but the question is, who did it? Now, Israel said, Jordan did it. They didn't know, right? Jordan said, it wasn't us. And we're tracking the killers ourselves. Glob Pasha said, we're, we're not there, because he didn't want a, 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 another raid by Israel. How do you know it wasn't Israeli Bedouins, says Glob Pasha? It was the Bedouins. It could be, you know, they, they cross the border, do whatever they want. Uh, nowadays, we know it was Bedouins from the Gaza Strip. So they're going to attack Jordan, but it, it wasn't Jordan's fault. You see, Sharet persuades the army not to retaliate. On this occasion, the State Department tries to help Israel in order to encourage a more pacific policy. But in the end, it blows up in their faces because the United Nations commander said, I guess, had it wasn't Jews. <laughs> Sharet said, you think Jews uh, blew, shot up a bus? You have no evidence. It's a Swedish guy. You said General Beneke. Um, and so you get the, in other words, the United Nations operates with a certain basic anti-Semitism at the, at, at, at the grounding level. and just irritates Israel. So what was the result? Nothing happened to the perpetrators. There's no uh, disincentive to continue such a thing. And Sharet didn't look like he gained anything out of this. It's not like the UN did something great for Israel. And so you're not supporting the one who should be supported, if that's what your policy wants to be. Um, within days, there's another Arab murder. You know, the Arabs come and kill some other Jews. The, and, and the cycle starts again. Israel goes and blows up a town called Nachalin. In general, Sharet loses control, though he continues to try. But the real decision makers are here. So look at what he writes. He says, there's a depression in the country because of the lack of retaliation. I told you, he writes everything in his diary. He says, the lack of retaliation, which is being interpreted as weakness and indifference to the loss of Jewish lives. The, throughout Mapai, there is a confusion and a lack of confidence of the correctness of my course. Among the military high command, there is mutual disquiet. 
muted disquiet. The most recent killings, again, demonstrates that the border is wide open and that this creates further depression, threatening a collapse of the morale among the settlers. The considerations are complex and require careful weighing between retaliation and restraint. This is the type of thing he used to write in his diary endlessly. And so you see, is indecision at the top. For Israel, they don't have the luxury of Hamlet. To be or not to be, you know? They don't have the luxury for that. That's for a play, Shakespeare. Israel has trouble. You're going to see why people are going to say like this. Sharet out and Gurim back in. Right or wrong, this is like, at least he knows what he's doing. He, he, by that I mean, at least he knows where he wants to go. Okay? Um, now, I'm not going to go a blow by blow, but this kind of description situation will continue throughout the years. And uh, Ben-Gurion has this whole public thing where he says, I'm just in the farm now. Here, take a look at this. It's, it's, it's a video. This is very famous. I'm in the farm. I'm a kibbutznik. I'm just taking the animals. I'm just taking, milking the cows and all this kind of stuff. And, and as you see, he, you know, he, he's, he, he knows he's being photographed. In reality, though, he's getting daily reports from Dayan. He goes, all the, it's Lush and Hara City, right? <laughs> and no, I mean, no, but I mean it. They say, like, and, and Charette is saying all the time, he says, I know they're meeting with him, and they're plotting against me, and they're criticizing my weakness. And publicly, he says, I'm just, a, you know, totally a farmer, a private citizen. I have nothing to do with anything. And, 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 and there you go, okay? So the whole situation w w was pretty bad. Um, in February of 55, I've taken you through 54, in February of 55, uh, Lavon, the defense minister, resigns because of a very big sc spy scandal that we'll talk about in the future, a biggie. So Charette then brings Ben-Gurion back from the farm as defense minister. So you understand what I'm talking about? Moshe Charette is the prime minister and Ben-Gurion is charged as defense minister. That's just going to aggravate everything, okay? Because what Ben-Gurion, of all people, has to listen to Charette. You know, who's going who's to win? And so Ben-Gurion comes back right away. We want bigger and better retaliations. This is the answer to everything. Um, we want peace, but peace through strength, and we are prepared to concede nothing. Now I'm going to show you a uh, five-minute uh, extended period I found on the uh, YouTube. It's very good from the BBC. They did it later in the year, beginning of, 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 of 56, actually, where the BBC goes and looks at... It's very interesting. You'll see that um, they look at Jerusalem... Uh, what we know now is the old city we're, we're in. When the Jordanians were there, you'll see how he walks by the empty Kotel. And then he interviews uh, King Hussein and Nasser, the president of Egypt, and Ben-Gurion. And I want you to pay close attention how Ben-Gurion uh, obfuscates. He really shoots the bull. And, he, and, he's gonna, and he's gonna sit there in a uniform, like he's a regular farmer, just in a uniform, because Israel is in constant, you know, under attack. And uh, what are you prepared to concede as far as the refugees are concerned? We'll give them everything they want to do in helping them to resettle the refugees among them. You understand? And, uh, and this brings out in a little video over here the, uh, what shall I say, the, 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 the uh, intractable nature of the conflict. Okay? Um, I'll say no more. Take it away. This is Jerusalem, divided between Arab and Israeli. On the right is the Garden of Gethsemane. It looks peaceful, but the tension we saw last week is repeated here. Near Jerusalem, barbed wire divides a village, and armed police are on patrol. Only the hens can safely wander over the frontier. Human beings must stay put. Relatives and friends may not visit each other. This old Arab's house is in the Jordan half of the village, but over there is the orchard he owns. It's now in Israel. He's not been in it for eight years. That small boy is his nephew. The old man has never held him in his arms. These Arabs are living in what was the Jewish quarter of the old city. The Jews were driven out in the Arab-Israeli war. But a far greater loss to the Jews was the Wailing Wall, all that's left of Solomon's temple. Jews have prayed here for 2,000 years. Now they want it back. In the old citadel, soldiers of the famous Arab Legion are always on guard against surprise attacks from Israel. Of all the Arab armies, this is the...
Yeah, the, I never have to go back and forth. You see, it's in, you know, they're talking past each other. The, uh, I, I just share that with you to give you an idea of the tension that characterizes this time. He talks about the problem of the frontiers. This is when Nasser was uh, establishing himself as the leader of Egypt. And the new government in, in uh, Egypt starts to get involved in this border situation, although most of the border raids from Gaza, which was controlled by Egypt, remember? The Egyptian army occupied Gaza Strip. Was the, most of the crossings were economics, but eventually the Egyptian military intelligence in 1954 begins to organize and train groups of Palestinians from Gaza to infiltrate Israel to spy and to kill. Israelis in the Negev in 1954 freak out. That's, you know, there, there's a lot uh, sent over there to attack, to steal, to blow up. It becomes really bad news. And there weren't many people, you know, Negev, especially at that time, even today is not largely settled. That time was much less so. Ben-Gurion was trying to set an example. See, I live in the Negev, right? But of course, there was a special army unit around stable care, you know. Anyway, um, in February of, um, of February 24th, 55, uh, the Fedayin, meaning the suicide squads, uh, from Egypt, uh, raid Rehovot and killed people there. In Rehovot. Uh, this is already not in a negative settlement. You understand? Rehovot is almost like Tel Aviv. So Israel it was crazy. Ben Gurion is back in the, as a defense minister this time. He says, bust them. And so Ben Gurion tells Dayan. Dayan tells Sharon. When an Egyptian army base in Gaza, meaning they went out to really give Nasser a black eye, they killed 100 uh, Egyptian soldiers, killed 100 Egyptian soldiers. They blew up a whole lot. These are the two uh, guys that did it. Uh, uh, Davidi and there's a uh, They look like you know they're they're out for uh, for for blood. Um, was this wise? And when I say was it wise, is if you go and uh, just deliver pinpricks here and there, especially sharp ones, what do you exactly expect is going to be the consequence? Now, so what's the game plan? What's the goal? The Ben Gurion's goal is hit him. But what's the goal? No, hit him. But what's the goal? And it's not easy to answer. And it's not clear that this was the right way to go, unless you simply say we have to teach him that when they kill somebody in Rehoboth, we blow up an Egyptian army base. But all Nasser does, he's very humiliated. He says, I'm going to blockade uh, the Gulf of Aqaba. That's when that happens. Uh, you understand, here's a lot. Here's uh, at the top. Here's the bottom of the Gulf. The Egyptians close it off over here. This will eventually, you know, be one of the uh, claims of Israel in the, in the Sinai campaign. But this is how it started when they uh, blew up the, uh, the uh, Egyptian army base over there. And so what I'm, it's getting boring, you know. It's, this one hits, this one, this one. Welcome to Israel 52, 56. Um, Nasser is humiliated, he, blocks, he blockades the area, and he says, we have to build up a real military. And he goes after it. He goes to America, and he says, I want real weapons. The John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State, says no. So Nasser says, okay, I'll go to Russia. And he goes to Russia, and they say yes. And the, and the rest is history, unfortunately. Because that began, when, when that happened, then Israel was in real trouble, right, for the first time. Because Russia, you know, launches what they call the Czech arms deal. The Russia said, we're not doing it. Czechoslovakia is doing it, but that's a Russian satellite. And it's a game changer. For the first time since 48, Israel's basic security is threatened. So was it a wise thing to do? You get what I'm saying? If the other guy's sleeping, even though you have a lot of pinpricks, and I'm not underestimating the value of life and how infuriating it is that you kill people in Rehoboth, I totally understand that. But you understand what I'm saying. If the other guy doesn't have much of an army, doesn't Israel want to keep it that way? And isn't it worth a lot of sacrifices to keep the other guy from getting activated and trying to change? But that's not what happened. The result is that they went to Russia eventually. The Russians, as you know, got in with both feet. They sent a huge amount of new jet planes and the best Russian tanks. And all of a sudden, Israel finds itself now under military danger. And, and by the way, in 55 and 56, Israel was freaking out. We're going to talk about this later. But they really went crazy. Children from school and parents gave, uh, what they call Karen Abarzel, gave their rings and things like that to, for the army to make uh, weapons. And then people thought it's a Holocaust. Okay? Now, in retrospect, we know it wasn't exactly like But that's not the way it seemed at that time. Um, Charette says to Ben-Gurion, you idiot. Ben-Gurion says to Charette, you wimp. And, this is, and this, is, this, is the, this is the basic system of political discourse behind the scenes at the top of Israel. As the Russian weapons arrive, as I told you, Israel freaks out. America will not, will not sell Israel weapons. Okay, so give you the weapons, you're going to cross the border and kill more Arabs. Such is the course of events as 1955 and 56 proceeds, punctuated by Arab raids and then big and humiliating Israeli raids. 
because the Israelis never do tit for tat. They do, you know, ten eyes for an eye, because who says you have the right to determine the, uh, you know, proportionality of the response? That, by the way, is true. One guy hits another guy, and then he goes and smashes him. He says, I just hit you. He says, who gave you the right to hit me? You see? And so, uh, I'll just, like I said, I can't go through all, but I just want to share with you one a particularly poignant story over here before we conclude. In April 56, uh, an Arab busted into Kfar Chabad, which had recently been built. Uh, Lubavitcher Hasidim came to Israel after 48, the state was established, and the Lubavitcher Rebbe, that's the Friedrich Rebbe, he told a whole group of, of Hasidic Jews from Russia, uh, who escaped out of Stalin and all that, which is, make Aliyah and go to Israel and set up something called Kfar Chabad. Fine. And by the way, I want to emphasize, Lubavitcher was very anti-Zionist in this period. But nevertheless, it's Israel, and there's a chance to do it, and, and we'll do it. Um, and so they established their settlement over there, and um, in uh, April of 56, right in this business, Kfar Chabad is not far from the border, it's not far from Lut Airport, right? We all pass it when we, when we take the bus or you try to play it. And how far is Lut Airport from, from the Arab frontier? Nothing. You forget, you drive out of Tel Aviv a few miles and then you're right near the frontier. That's the problem. And so the result was, Arabs busted in there and they found a bunch of kids dominating Marv and they spread and machine gunned everybody and it was a big horror, you understand? Sprayed fire over, they killed uh, five kids and wounded others, and things like this. It's a very interesting story. Um, the uh, Lubavitch and Chassidim were all shaken up naturally, and they said, we went through pogroms in, in Russia, we went through Stalin, we went through Hitler, and now we come to Israel, I thought we'd finally you know, get a little bit of peace. Maybe we should move back to Europe somewhere, America. And Lubavitch every sent him a uh, telegram, he says, stay there, and he says, we can read it, it says, that was the three words. Only by continuing to build will you find um, comfort. Right? So he turns out to be the biggest Zionist of all them because, because he's saying the only response to uh, terrorism is to build. You see? But it's hard, right? Now, if you're a Babish, you just go to follow whatever he says, and that's it. But it's hard. As a human being, I'm saying an emotional level. Israel, therefore, you see, has, an, has increasing existential anxiety, which Nasser does not perceive, and it will explode in the 56th Sinai campaign. When Israel will attack Egypt in 1956 in October under very specific circumstances that we'll talk about in the future, you have to understand it's an explosion of a volcano of, of anxiety and resentment more than a planned uh, kind of attack. Ben-Gurion will celebrate the Sinai campaign as a great triumph. Sharet will describe it as pointless as it gained Israel absolutely nothing. Because you all know, without me telling you, they had to give everything up anyway. Eisenhower forced them back. And so what'd you gain? Oh, we defeated the Egyptian army. So what's that? So what? They're going to come back stronger and with more Russian weapons than before. So what'd you gain? You see? It's all due to those doggone borders. It was true in 48, and unfortunately it's true in 2013. And this is really an existential problem. And, and no one has a solution. Because the consensus of the entire international community, including Israel's friends, I repeat, includes Israel's friends, the way you define Israel's friends today is they say, just go back to the 67 borders and have real peace. Nobody says that they should change any of this, you see? Even, the, even those international leaders who are in Israel's corner, they say, but of course, the European leaders. But they'll go back to the 67 borders, just the Arabs won't attack them. But you can see from what I just described to you that it's a lot more complicated than that, and God only knows if Israel ever does have to pull back to these lines or, or, or something, variation of it. Is it true today that they're going to be more pacific than before, or is it rather true that now that every fool can have a, an iPhone and, and direct missiles? And here's, as we see from the signing campaign, it creates a nightmare. Welcome to the very difficult world of Israel's top national security managers. And with that, I bet you good night.